All right, hello, wine drinking people. Time for more of what I've had to drink yesterday, and this was a special tasting I put together for Jerry Bergheim, the Hollywood Wine Society, the oldest wine group in Florida. Hey, I don't mean you guys are old, but the group's been around longer than any other group in Florida. There's a couple of old dudes in there, but these guys know their wines, and, uh, you know, uh, they wanted to showcase one of the greatest producers in California. I did Lewis for them last year, and uh, this year Jerry said, you know, what about Paul Meyer? And I said, what a coincidence, man. I'm going out there to see their newest thing, the Wayfarer Wines, and check out the Wayfarer Vineyard out on the Sonoma Coast. What an incredible trip. So I just got back a few weeks before I got to present these wines, so very fresh in my mind, my trip. And uh, Paul Meyer Wines, we're very familiar with here. I think we've gotten every single release at the Wine Watch. See, the Wine Watch started in 1983. Jason Paul Meyer released his first wine in 86. I learned on my trip that he actually made an 85 Chardonnay under a different label uh, before that, but the Paul Meyer wine started in 86. And uh, he and John Caldwell were good buddies, and they uh, traveled to France together, visited some of the world's great vineyards in Bordeaux, and actually smuggled back some cuttings with them. And, uh, well, it just so happens John's father owned 55 acres in Combsville they took those cuttings and planted a vineyard and uh, when people looked at it they said man you guys what the hell were you doing man what were you smoking out here and uh, you know it took it six years to get the first leaf off of it usually it only takes three but uh, their friend Randy Dunn when he tasted the first batch of this wine he said man I will buy every grape you guys have out here in this vineyard and it wasn't Randy Dunn that started making the wine he hired Helen Turley instead and it turned out to be a good move Helen turned out to be uh, well she's one of the top wine making consultants in California right now she doesn't do much work anymore she just works on her own vineyard you may have heard of it Marcuson and that's why she brought uh, Justin out to the Sonoma Coast to show him a nearby ranch that was for sale and he bought that in 1987 and started to develop it and it took them 12 years before they, well, 97, I think, I'm sorry, and started to develop that. And it took them up until the 2012 vintage before they thought they were ready to release another product with a separate identity from this vineyard. The Wayfarer Vineyard is 30 acres planted and uh, 30 different one-acre blocks. And the Chardonnay is comprised of 10 different blocks. And this is the best fruit from those 10 blocks. Their first release, the 2012. Very similar Marcus sound to me. Really lovely richness. A decadent wine. It's got this lovely Asian pear, white peach, and lemon curd kind of fruit with vanilla, nutmeg, and cinnamon spice. Very rich and creamy on the tongue. This wine's got incredible depth of fruit, layers of mineral, and wonderful acidity here. A really long finish. And even better on the second day... Uh, wow, that's all I have to say. Most excellent juice. One of the best Chardonnays that I've had this year. Then the two Pinot Noirs that we had, they do make five different Pinot Noirs. The Traveler was my favorite, and luck, unfortunately, that's the smallest production one. But the Wayfarer, which is a blend of all the different clones they have on the property, the largest production wine of 800 cases. This wine also thick and viscous. Lovely richness here. Red berry fruit. And uh, this Sonoma Coast area, these guys are just two ridge lines in from the ocean, so you get a, love, a wonderful, cool... Uh, a breeze there and you really notice the crispness in these wines they have wonderful acidity hey they're on a hot spot here so you definitely get some wonderful fruit in these wines also but uh the cool nights bring wonderful acidity to this pinot noir grape and that's one of the things that pinot noir needs to give it structure because it doesn't have a lot of tannins the golden mean wine does however a little bit of tannins this wine is a blend of three different clones and uh much smaller production only 200 cases a little richer uh, a little more spiced on this wine but uh both of these pinots really big and even bigger on the second day which the palmeyer pinot we had the 2011 different vintage and uh, this is a cooler year. This wine, very bright and some lovely black raspberry fruit. And a bit leaner compared to the Wayfarer wines to me, although a lot of people like this better. And I think because, because we first when we showed it on the first night, it just was more drinkable. On the second day, to me, it was really evident that the Wayfarer wines were just richer, more concentrated, and more complex. But this Palmeyer uh, Pinot Sonoma Coast was excellent as well. All right, and then the flight of 2001s. These guys like old wines. 2001? Still babies from these Paul Meyer. Let me tell you, the Jason, we showed these wines blind, and a couple of people did pick out several of the wines here. We showed the Merlot, the Paul Meyer Red, and the Cheval des Andes. Wait a minute. 
That's not a wine from Paul Meyer. These guys like to mix it up a little bit and throw in something just to challenge them to see if they can, you know, figure out what it is. And a couple of people picked out the Chevelle de Zandi, so most people missed it. Most people thought it was the Paul Meyer Red. But the Paul Meyer Red and the Jason, to me, were definitely akin and uh, brothers. The Paul Meyer Jason, a bit more forward here. Some lovely, delicious fruit still in this wine, still very much alive. A little bit of tannin at the end. Cut from the same cloth as that Paul Meyer, though, that cedar, some of those earthy, loamy notes, and uh, just a lot lot more drinkable and that's what you're trying to accomplish with a second wine. Paul Meyer, one of the first to start making a second wine of all the major producers in Napa. And uh, the Merlot, wow, very plummy and rich Merlot. This is a Cabernet drinker's Merlot. The 2001 still has excellent structure here, but you notice not as much tannins in these other wines. This wine had lovely freshness though, a quality that we love about Merlot and why Merlot can age. The Paul Meyer Red, like I said, this was the big boy in the flight. This was my favorite wine in the flight. Most excellent and still a lot of big tannins here on the finish here. That cedar, that plum, that uh, cigar box spice in this wine. Still really big, like the Jason times two at least. And the Chevelle de Zandis to me was fairly different than the other wines. I think that's why people picked it out as the Jason. Showing a little more dark earth, very Bordeaux-like. It's Malbec and uh, Cabernet. It did show the pedigree of a top-level wine, though. Definitely stood up to the Paul Meyer, and uh, I thought was most excellent also. All right, the 96 and 97, 92 flight. Kind of an odd thing. We were supposed to have a 97 Merlot. It didn't arrive in time, so we threw the 92 in there just to give you a little older version, and these were blind also. Almost everyone picked out the Lagrange, which very Bordeaux-like, this 96. A great vintage. A lot of fresh earth, some black olive, cigar box spice, that dark cherry and plum fruit. Still has firm tannins on the tongue, uh, but nice array of fruit here still. This wine, very well built, and uh, the most old world wine of any wine on the table. Still very good potential to age this wine, showing very fresh at the end. Excellent juice. The Paul Meyer Red 96, most improved on the second day. This wine had a lot of fruit left on it the next morning. Red plum and cherry, fine herbs, some loamy earthy notes, some tobacco spice, and uh, really nice on the palate. The second flight was definitely the wines that were drinking at their peak in most people's opinion here. Still nice structure in this wine. The 96 vintage had really good tannins, some nice spice and tobacco on the finish. Most excellent juice. The 97 was the wine of the night though. Almost everybody's scorecard, they picked this. It had the most just delicious, juicy red berry fruit and tobacco spice. Still a nice amount of acidity here too. Very well balanced. This wine was just hitting on all cylinders. I would say you could keep it for a decade or more in your cellar, but it's going to be hard to resist once you open one one bottle up because like I said it is drinking at its peak right now. The 92 still had a little fruit left. Some nice tobacco spice and herbs in this wine. Some loamy earthy notes a little bit more pronounced in this wine and some tannins here on the finish but not as much fruit. Definitely not as much fruit as either the 97 or 96. You want to drink up the 92s if you have them. The 95s Wow, these wines were great on the second day. 95, like 94, an exceptional vintage. But 94 got all the rave. A lot of people forgot about 95. This Merlot, silky and velvety on the tongue. Really juicy red berry fruit and plum. Some nice cocoa notes on the finish here. And uh, the, the Paul Meyer Red just seemed a little bit bigger. Had a little longer finish. This wine had a lovely bouquet. Cigar box spice, loam, red currants, fresh herbs and a really long finish. This wine had lovely balance, silky tannins, and uh, like I said, drinking at its peak right now. Most excellent juice. One of my favorite wines on the table. The 87, unfortunately, did not fare as well. I think the 87 de Cru Bocayou, uh, a good example of a bad vintage in Bordeaux. A lot of people said, this wine's bad, it's corked, whatever. It wasn't. I mean, to me, it was just 87 de Cru Bocayou. Not showing at its best. I thought it opened up nice on the second morning. Had a a lot of cigar box spice and pepper, but uh, the fruit here kind of dried out. Still drinkable, but only if you like old wines. This group likes old wines. Not a lot of people like this wine, but uh, like I said, just the 87 vintage in Bordeaux to me. 87 Paul Meyer, however, still had some nice uh, pine and kind of bell pepper. This was all Caldwell fruit, so different from the other wines. You know, when Helen Turley took over, she said, you know, there's a lot of other great vineyards in Napa. We can make a better wine if we blend some of this other fruit in. So uh, this is one of the first few wines. So the second vintage, actually, still all 100% Caldwell fruit from Coombsville. And a little bit dried out in the fruit department. I'd say this wine has definitely seen better days. The 87, if you like older wines, you're still going to enjoy it. Still has nice balance, but uh, doesn't have the fruit that the 95, 96, or 97 wines did on this evening. That's what we had to drink at our Paul Meyer tasting. I'm your host, Andrew Lampasoni, signing off for the Wine Watch saying remember, always drink the good stuff first.